morning, everyone. I'm going to follow on a little bit from Shishimoshi's talk yesterday. And I guess I'm going to call this talk Impediments, Challenges, Barriers, and Setbacks. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the not just the traditional hindrances, but various things that can impede, uh, let's say, our enjoyment, particularly of session, but in our practice overall. So a lot of you have heard this story about Bernie Glassman from my uh, book, One Bird, One Stone. And uh, the story goes that Bernie was giving a talk and at the end, he asked for questions and a woman raised her hand and said, how do we live in the now? And Bernie said, would anybody not living in the now please stand up? So his point being that we're all living in the now, but we have this peculiar ability to forget that we're living in the now. And, uh, I think a lot of you know I teach university classes in meditation. And one of the early questions I'll ask the class is which creatures share the earth with us who live pretty much entirely in the now. And for this reason, when they're not actively suffering, when they have enough to eat and you know, feel safe and all of that, and they seem pretty satisfied with their lives. Of course, the answer is all of them, even we as children know how to live in the present moment, but as adults, or maybe somewhere before adulthood, around adolescence, or a little bit earlier, when we start to forget about the present moment, and we start living in our minds. So, of course, we all keep some contact with the present moment, oftentimes in, into adulthood, but some of us, somewhere along the way seem to forget it. And then we can be driving past a beautiful sunset and just thinking about inconsequential nothings because our mind has taken over. And, and if you've ever felt like all the magic and wonder has gone out of life and life's just one problem after another, we can be pretty sure we've lost touch with the present moment. So. I think we all know the present moment is where the reality of our lives happens. It's the only place it happens. And so we're practicing for a week in session. We have this glorious opportunity to just practice staying with the present moment. That's really our only business. So you could say it's the practice of reality. Our practice is always the practice of reality. And in session, we get a really concentrated dose of that. So the way I see it, there's only really three things that get in the way of us being with the present moment. One is spacing out. One is sloth and torpor, the traditional name for that convince of sleepiness or grogginess. And the other one, of course, is thinking, which is the one we probably struggle with the most. But let me talk a little bit about the first two. Spacing out can be, in a way, the hardest obstruction to notice through our practice. Spacing out means we're not really focused up, we're not really present. We're kind of half here, half there, in kind of a dreamy state. We don't have to be thinking about anything to be spaced out but we're just slightly floating in the ethers. And I think the difference is that if we were to smell smoke when we're doing zazen, it, the proper way, which is really focused up, really truly present, then we would, doesn't matter if we, in deep samadhi, we would instantly jump up and we'd know what to do or at least we'd know to get out of the room. If we're spacing out, we might just sit there and burn, right? <laughs> so, or we might wait till it's too late. So it can be hard to catch ourselves in spacing out, but even though at a certain point in our zazen, we do 
forget body and mind. So we do get to this deep state where we're not uh, crisply aware moment to moment of our surroundings and our body and et cetera. But we're in this focused, um, poised state to where we could, we could come back just like that to our surroundings and we'd know how to deal. So spaced out is who even knows where we are. We're not really present. In Zazen, we're ultra present. And even when we go past awareness of body and mind, we're deeply present in our awareness. So, so that's handled, no problem there, right? <laughs> oftentimes, uh, oftentimes this kind of spacing out happens toward the middle of session when the body settled in, we're not necessarily suffering all that much in our physical body and we've gotten over sleepiness. And we're just kind of coasting along on the ether, so not really efforting at all. Roshi said yesterday, effortless effort. So effortless effort is one of those terms like, one of those paradoxical terms like uh, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. It works both ways. Effortless effort means we're efforting, but not in a way where we're straining but it doesn't mean we're not efforting. So we're efforting in a way that doesn't feel like strenuous, tense effort. So to come to sloth and torpor, this is my primary hindrance personally, something that I often have to deal with. Um, when I was 30 years old, which was a surprisingly long time ago, uh, I walked across the country, I had just walked across the country with a group called the Great Peace March for Nuclear Disarmament. And I was staying with a friend uh, on the East Coast after we walked from Los Angeles to, uh, to Washington, D.C. And I was staying with a friend's family up near New York. And I turned 30 and I got this horrible flu. Of course, I turned 30, so I thought my life was over, and uh, um, which seems amusing now. But uh, but I really sort of thought my life was over there for a while because I got this horrible flu, and it never really went away. And like a lot of people who develop chronic fatigue syndrome, oftentimes that's where how it starts is with a big blow to the body's immune system, and I I still have it to this day. So, so sloth and torpor, which comes out of that that chronic fatigue issue, it's actually gotten better recently because with uh, current medical technology and genetic testing, we've finally been able to find out in the last few years what is causing it, which has to do with certain genetic factors that can be addressed. But for decades, I had no idea what it, what it was. Nobody else did either. And uh, I was one of the first people, most of the doctors I went to had seen who had it. And so they didn't, half the time, they didn't even believe it was real. Of course, now everybody's got chronic disease syndrome. It's a very popular illness, you may have noticed. Everybody knows someone who's got it. <laughs> so all the cool people have it. but. Anyway, um, when you're 30 years old, you can barely get out of bed. Things are looking pretty rough. And so I did something rather crazy, which was I decided to start formal Zen practice. And uh, I was desperate, which is, as you can imagine, you know, 30 years old can barely function and nobody knows what it is and know who's gonna take care of you. And I thought, well, uh, I don't know where else to go, but Eastern practices have always made sense to me. Buddhism especially has made sense to me. And Zen has especially, especially made sense to me. So I'm going to find a Zen teacher when I get back to the West Coast, which is where I was, uh, my primary residence was. And so I started practicing at UCLA. And talk about fatigue, you can imagine 
what it's like to dive into sashims when I could get out of bed, but let's just say whenever I was out of bed, all I could think about was wanting to get back to it. And I felt like it was going to pass out a good deal of the time. That's kind of the shape I was in. And here we were getting up at, I forget what time we were getting up to, 4.30 in the morning, probably or 5. And sitting till 9 or 9.30, a little bit longer than we were sitting here. Basically, you could get about seven hours sleep a night. I really appreciate with the song that we can actually, if we go right to bed, we can actually get eight hours sleep. Makes a big difference. But that's not the way it was there. And on top of that, somebody had recently painted the windows and windowsills and window frames, and they mixed up all of the screens. And there were a lot of buildings in UCLA. And so all the screens had been put in the wrong windows and none of them fit right. And they had a koi pond, which was a great breeding ground for mosquitoes. So on top of only being in bed for six and a half, seven hours, you'd be lying there around your head and then it was in a, your usual overcrowded dormitory and somebody would always jump up finally screaming in the middle of the night, unable to take it, turn on the lights and just start smashing mosquitoes. So, um, but the funny thing was, that the, the focus on the breath and the focus on the hara restored my strength. And even for a while, within about six months, the chronic fatigue had gone into remission. Now, as I've gotten older, it's come and gone and come and gone. And I've had to add in yoga and qigong and other things to keep myself strong. Um, but, uh, but, just that focus upon the breath and upon the hara started to work pretty quickly. So sloth and torpor, I think we all experience it at some times and often I'll experience it the first few days of session. Fortunately, not so much this one, but it's not been uncommon for the first three days for me to be working with nothing but extreme sleepiness, lethargy, fatigue. And my method, which I developed a long time ago, was um, to really have an almost obsessive focus upon the breath. And for those of you who deal with this, the only thing that works is the minute you feel it start to come on, you gotta get right on it. Because once you're deep into lethargy, it's, all, it's very, very difficult to pull it, to turn it around because the very nature of it is that you don't want to do anything, right? You don't want to make any effort. And to me, there's nothing more torturous, few things more torturous than nodding out um, on the cushion. Some people seem to be able to do it and it doesn't bother them. For me, it's just complete torture. So, so what I found, and this was on recommendation from Dido Rochi, I've heard all sorts of uh, advice on how to wake oneself up, none of which ever worked until Dido told me this tip, which I'll share with you, which is to start by first extending the exhale so that we're exhaling all the stale air, not to the point of strain, but if you were to try it even now, I bet you'd get two or maybe three exhales after you think you're finished with your exhale and uh, without even feeling like you're strained. And if that doesn't work after a few minutes, then I'll extend the inhale. And same thing, if we were to take an inhale right now and stop where we naturally stop, I bet there'd be room without strain for two or three more inhales. And I say, just to start first with the exhale because the inhale can be so stimulating combined with extending the exhale. If we're expending all our stale air and bringing in that much new air, all of a sudden you may find yourself designing solutions to 
climate change in your mind and all sorts of other brilliant ideas. And, uh, and then you've got another problem, which is your mind's running away with you. So sometimes just extending the out breath, which is an inherently um, relaxing breath that inherently triggers the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the relaxation response. And, uh, but it also, uh, because we're, we're breathing out all the stale air, it also wakes us up and alerts us, but it doesn't tend to overstimulate. So then, then there's working with the Hara. And I think we've all done this kind of Hara practice. Um, but I want to share some tips with you uh, around it because um, some of which I've discovered myself and then I've been looking into uh, how other lineages practice with the Hara. And of course, we're often told to put our attention there and we're often told to uh, put our call on there for working on a column, for instance, or to dissolve whatever mental obsession we have going into the Hara. And all of that works well, but there's ways to make it a little bit more precise. And um, I looked a little bit into uh, some of the techniques that some of the pure Rinzai sects have. And Kyoto gave me a book by Mark Mado, M-E-I-D-O. I'm not going to remember his last name, but that would be enough for you to find it. Um, uh, about certain Rinzai techniques for energy accumulation that we haven't learned in our lineage, specific ones. And um, so I want to share a few of these with you. The, we may not realize this, but the work with the Hara did not come from the original Buddhism. That is an innovation to Buddhist practice that came from Taoism. And that's a very Taoist thing to, uh, the Hara is the, uh, in Chinese medicine, they recognize three primary energy centers, the Dan Hien, which is the same as the Hara, and the heart and the third eye and many secondary ones, but it's not like the Indian system where there's seven chakras. Still, the Hara is more or less equivalent to the second chakra in the Indian system. If you know that. Anyway, uh, one thing I had noticed and that he always mentions, and I'm gonna encourage us to try it right now. A lot of people try to put their mind in the Hara by will, and it doesn't work very well. It kind of bounces off it. What we need to do is allow the attention to drop to the heart. And an image I like to use, and again, you might try it right now, is if you toss a flat rock into a swimming pool filled with jello, it would slowly make its way to the bottom in no particular hurry. And in just such a way, if we let the attention drop out of Considering that we're listening to a talk right now, it's very likely in our head. Even if not, you can still let it set its price. If you've ever seen those uh, Star Wars movies where they have the giant robot and there's a little control tower in basically in the robot's forehead and there's two little guys up there looking out the window and running the robot. I kind of feel like that's not a bad image for the way we live a lot. We're just completely up here controlling this robot of the body. But as Roshi said yesterday, Zazen is actually a somatic practice as much as it's anything else. And if we're not in the body, we're missing a big part of what it is. So let's just try letting that flat rock drift down through the jello in no hurry. And if you let it keep dropping, I think you'll find a place it likes to settle. If you let it keep dropping through the abdomen. And there's actually a nerve bundle a couple of inches below the navel, which corresponds 
roughly to where the hara actually is. And it's not on the outside of the body, it's right in the center, under the navel. I would be willing to bet that for everybody it's located slightly differently. But it's funny if we just let the mind, I'm talking about the attention factor of the mind, if we just let it drop. We might be able to find just by feel where that spot is. And there's a feeling of settledness that comes with that. That nerve bundle is, you may have heard that scientists have discovered that there are brain-like neurons in both the heart and the gut. And this is the location of those neurons in the gut, roughly, and not the physical gut, but in the gut region, which is why we say we have gut feelings. And um, the dinosaurs, apparently, some of the larger dinosaurs were so big, they needed almost a second brain to operate their second half. And this is that same nerve bundle that in them functioned almost like a second brain to run the back half of their body. In our case, it's like a second brain to run Zazen. So I've also had to take on the practice of Tai Chi and Qigong just because of my energy issue and it's worked very well. And we've already learned from Zazen that the Hara is the spiritual center or energy center of the body, but this is also the gathering place for Qi in the Tai Chi and Qigong system. So when I was first sick, what I needed more than anything was to gather some tea. And I didn't quite realize it, but that's what I was doing. The other thing that I've noticed beyond all of that is it's very easy for us to not really be paying full attention to the breath. And by this, I mean, The full duration, you know, beginning, middle, and then all the points in between, it's an ever shifting array of sensations. And at the bottom of the exhale, there's a turning point to the inhale, which, if we allow that to extend to a brief pause, as it's comfortable for your body, we may find that body, mind, and emotions really like to settle down in that space before the inhale begins. If we notice that, we kind of seat ourselves there from our center place in the hara, and it is a center place, it's a center of gravity as well. And for further somatic explorations, I encourage everybody to come to the stretching half hour at 2.30 and to really pay attention to those movements from that point because it's the center of gravity of the body. And when we're, when we're doing movement, we can feel that if we're paying attention to Hara. And it can help us work with developing the ability to sustain our attention. And then there's the inhale, of course, and beginning, middle, end of the inhale, and all points between all have their own particular feeling. And then there's the turning point or brief pause when the lungs have filled before we begin the exhale. Now, a lot of our issues with the breath is we're too passive in paying attention. I had a friend recently sit in on one of my classes for beginners and I gave this, this exact instruction pretty much. She'd been practicing longer than I have for 40 years. She came up to me afterwards and said, it never occurred to me to notice 
all the sensations of an exhale from the beginning to end. She was astounded that they were ever changing and, and what a variation there was. She, I don't exactly know what she was paying attention to, except that I've done it myself, especially early in practice. You can be paying attention to the exhale, but not in a very close way. Paying attention in a close way, I just can't tell you how helpful it is. It's, uh, it changes the whole thing. You know, it's so easy to be paying kind of partial, dreamy attention to sort of an idea of the breath. And this is really embodying it in the hara. And particularly noticing that relaxation response with the exhale through the whole duration of the exhale, body, mind, and emotion all tend to want to settle down. And if we really pay attention to that, and especially pay attention to the turning point or brief pause before the inhale, we can gently seek to keep that relaxation and stillness to the inhale, which is normally an activating day. And then when we reach the next exhale, that will deepen. And if you've ever seen the kind of singing bowls or Tibetan bowls similar to the ones we use, where if you take the striker and run it continuously around the rim two or three times without breaking contact, the bowl will begin to sing. In the same way, if we can keep our mind with continuous contact with the breath cycle, or even two or three cycles, something in us begins to sing. Now, Roshi spoke yesterday of joy in practice, and he mentioned that if we're, if practice becomes another thing we gotta do, that's not pleasant, we probably won't stick with it. But that feeling of continuous attention, meticulous continuous attention centered in the hara soon gives rise to a pleasant feeling. Maybe even once around the breath continuously. We have to watch to make sure our attention is steady and continuous. Very common for it to break off and then reestablish and break off and reestablish instead of being continuous. And that's like turning the flame up and down and up and down and up and down on those two blocks. It takes a long time to get a cup of tea. You want that steady flame. I know this is all pretty nerdy. I call this being a breath nerd. I urge us to all become breath nerds because the closer we pay attention to it, the more we'll find that that feeling of pleasantness, of course, is the entryway to samadhi. And oftentimes in Zen practice, we don't talk so much about the pleasure of sitting. And I was so glad to hear Roshi speak of it yesterday. Because in the early Buddhist writings, there's a lot of talk of the pleasure, then joy, and then growing to bliss and even rapture that comes with entering samadhi. Of course, the pitfall is that we don't want to get hooked on that because some things are better than bliss. That goes beyond bliss or rapture. But the path goes through those things. So it's a, it's a pretty good signal that we're headed in the right direction if we start to feel that sense of pleasure at first. It might be no more than the kind of pleasure we have with sitting in a warm bath. But Roshi also spoke yesterday of motivation and, uh, and an intention. And when we're experiencing the pleasure, can we remember 
Sometimes we've forgotten as adults, but we remember that there's a part of the mind that likes to follow pleasure. We can use that in our favor, even though running around seeking worldly pleasures, obviously, is often cautioned against. This is the pleasure of Zazen, and it's okay to let ourselves sink into it and enjoy it, and even gently seek to sustain it. This is a gentle, non-grasping seeking to sustain. It's like encouraging your shoulders not to start to clench up when you're working on the computer for long hours. You're easily going, come on, guys, let's not tighten up. If you shout at them and tell them to relax, it's not going to work, right? It's much the same way you can easily recognize, ooh, I'm feeling something here that feels right. And just gently stay with it. That's what we're looking for. Now, sometimes when we're in a bath, the telephone may ring, right? It's this great temptation to get out of the bath and grab the telephone. But we know it's only going to be somebody selling us a new warranty for our car or something like that. And so if we're smart and we need that relaxation for the bath, we're going to just let the telephone ring and not ruin the bath by getting up, dripping all over the place and answering it. In just such a way, that pleasure of just resting in the stillness that comes from that continuity of practice, continuity leads to death. We can resist, we can use the fact that we know grabbing the next thought will only ruin them to encourage ourselves not to answer that ringing telephone of the mind, just let it ring. Okay. If this all feels like we're in a battle and it's kind of grim and we're going to grit our teeth and get through it and resist the telephone and resist thinking all this, we're just creating all this tension. We need to relax body, mind, emotions, while at the same time maintaining alertness. That's the balance we're looking for. So all of this adds up to that Zazen can become either too Raspy and strenuous, too much of a battle, or it can become too passive. What we really want is a spirit of inquiry. And we have to slow down the mind to summon and sustain the spirit of inquiry. But that just has to do with our intention for practice. Why are we really here? This was easy for me when I was ill because I was desperate. <laughs> And, and I had that six or 7% of faith that Yamada Roshi was talking about that Zen might help. And sure enough, it did. So for those of us who are desperate, and there are many forms of desperation, physical, emotional, existential. If you've got some desperation, by all means, you say, harness that desperation. There's a lot of energy and use that to drive the inquiry. But if we slow down enough just to ask ourselves, hmm, is it really true that relaxation deepens throughout the exhale and that I can really keep my attention steady and notice these myriad changes, not just in the lungs and in the abdomen, but all through the body as everything settles. Hmm, I hadn't noticed that before. That's interesting. Is it really true? The mind may completely come to a stop sometimes in the pause before the inhale, and that if I gently seek to sustain that, I can maintain that stillness through the inhale and through the gap to the exhale, and then the next exhale deeper. 
all of a sudden we get that um, nerd action of our brains going and it can become very interesting. So we want to summon that quality of interest. And then the other thing, I think just about everyone here has been practicing for some years. The other thing is that our techniques wear out and the techniques we're taught wear out. Has anyone noticed that? If we find ourselves bored and our practice is flat, it's very often that we're, you know, that definition of insanity, we've all heard that it's um, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It's a bit like that. Um, we might just need to take hold of our practice. After all, it's our practice, isn't it? And find creatively what it feels like when it's working. And I understand we've all been taught that there's no bad thoughts and, and that even if it doesn't seem to be working, we should do it. And that's true. But if it doesn't seem to be working for a year and then another year, there's something wrong. <laughs> so um, we know what it's like when it's functioning for us. And this is our practice. Once we're grounded in practice, I can't tell you how many new ways I've found into keeping my practice alive creatively. One of them is what I just discovered. I mean, what I just described for you is what I mean to say. That close, continuous attention on the breath without breaking off. Now, I know we've received instruction along those lines, but this is really taking a little bit deeper and deeper. How deep can I go with this? How interested can I get in it? What's happening in the rest of the body? Where do I actually feel the breath? I find I feel my breath easily down into my hips and thighs and all the way up to my head with each breath. It could become using that broad peripheral awareness Roshi spoke of with the attention focused on the hara. It can be very interesting to notice where do I where do I feel it elsewhere in the body and what parts of the body I just touch it with the mind or holding tension and might just want to release that. This is all about getting more somatic. Hey, let's get somatic. That's not what we thought was exciting when we were 19. But again, it's this aspect of being a nerd <laughs> about the breath body and about Zazen. That's, that's, it becomes fascinating, actually. It becomes very, very interesting. And joyous, and practice becomes joyous. I have to say the first 10 or more years of my practice was very, very, very difficult. I had a lot of physical pain, and I had a lot of trouble with my mind and a lot of emotional issues. But eventually they all became interesting. When pain becomes interesting and we're willing to really investigate it, we find that pain is not a continuous wall bearing down on us to smash us. Pain is made up of myriad sensations and maybe we can get interested enough to look at it or even enter it. Same when emotion arises. Yes, we're practicing the present moment, but when a ball of emotion arises within us, which incidentally, when that first happened to me, I tried to talk to my Zumi Roshi about it, forget it. Tried to talk to Dido Roshi about it, forget it. Uh, that I, I just realized I had to take care of the emotions myself. Of course, in this Sangha, we know we're gifted with teachers who understand that dealing with the emotions is part of it. But at that point, early in my practice, I was on my own. so. I knew emotions were important and I wasn't just gonna shut off, shut them off, shut up and be zazen without somehow trying to put aside the emotion. I did zazen with the emotion and I felt like enormous burdens of the past cleared because I was willing to pay attention to them. Just like 
enormous tensions dropped off when I was willing to pay attention to discomfort in the body and use the breath and release them. So, koans in a way we could think of as an almost artificial means to raise that spirit of inquiry if we don't have it already, right? Because that we're inquiring into the koan, that's what we're doing. But all of, whether we're doing shikantaza or no matter what we're doing, we should be, the more interested we are, the more we raise that spirit of inquiry, the, the better it all works. And we should know when it's working and we should know when it's not working. I'm not talking about one bad day. Everyone has one once in a while, you know, where the practice isn't working, but, but if it's not working for a long time, I'll give you an example. Um, at a certain point, I had to define for myself what thinking was. And that sounds stupid, but I wonder how many other people have been through this as well, because I was years into my practice and I thought, wait, how do I know when I'm thinking? And I had to really, I had to really define it for myself. Okay. There's a little monologue going on in my mind. That's thinking. Is that the whole of thinking? No, no, I can also be thinking if a little movie is running through my mind. I think those are the two primary ones, but I also think there's other ways to think as well. I bet perfume makers think in terms of scent, and chefs think in terms of food, you know. And when we fantasize sometimes, that warm beach that Roshi talked about, fantasizing about yesterday, we're, we're thinking the feeling of the sun on our bodies, aren't we? So for me, it started out with words, and then I got really specific. Words about the past, definitely don't need those. That was so useful for months and months and months. A thought would start to rise in my head, and I think that's about the past. Useless in Zazen, let it go. That thought's about the future. Useless in Zazen, let it go. Then I got down to, these are words. Useless in Zazen, let it go. This is a little movie, useless in Zazen, let it go. Finally, and this is a process of inquiry and digging down. And then it's like, okay, these things became easy to let go. Well, what else is there? And you start to realize, oh, any object of mind is not the point in Zazen. Anything that appears in our awareness isn't it. Anything that appears in that way to us as an object, separate from the awareness which receives it, it's not the point. And once I realized that, that worked. Oh, that still works. <laughs> so, um, anyway, just some, some tips to um, help us in our practice. If we set off to do a great adventure, travel across India by rail or climb the mountain um, or set off to the Antarctic, we might complain to ourselves about certain of the conditions because the adventures inevitably involve suffering, don't they? And setbacks and all these things, challenges. But, but I don't think we'd be climbing that, uh, doing that trek in Nepal and climbing that mountain and thinking, boy, mountains suck. I don't know why they were made so hard. Mountains were just made wrong, you know? But this is what we'll tell ourselves when we're sitting, right? There's something wrong with the practice. Roshi talked about this yesterday too. There's something wrong with the practice. There's something wrong with the tradition. There's something wrong with the teachers, right? It's just like the mountain, it's just there, okay? <laughs> it's all about us. If, if, if we have that spirit of adventure, that this is, we're on a quest, Roshi said yesterday too. He was on a roll yesterday, wasn't he? That was a great time. We're on this quest. It's a really important thing we're doing. We're not just sitting, you know, with our legs aching, paying attention to our breath, you know, because somebody told us to or for no good reason. This is, the, this is the quest to find out who we are. You know, it's a big deal. The more we can remind ourselves that 
and keep summoning that excitement and spirit of adventure and that intention to continue with the adventure, then the whole thing shifts. And I've got to say for more than 10 years, Session is none other than joy every single time, you know? And all I can say is that, that is glorious. <laughs> and I, I hope for everybody that they, uh, that they experience that. Because there's because nothing comes nothing comes up before the mind that's really an impediment that's wrong. Everything's accepted. Nothing's grasped. Here comes pain. Here comes difficulty. Here comes sleepiness. This is a I don't know how to deal with all of this stuff. This is this is what zazen is, is in part is dealing with this stuff, right? So it's uh, a lot of it is our attitude that views it as a problem. Anyway, what a glorious opportunity to be with reality. Do we want to miss our lives? That's what reality is. It's the truth of our life moment to moment. Are we interested in that? Then what a great opportunity. We should put ourselves into every single moment, shouldn't we? So, look forward to sitting with you for the rest of the week. And let's just go up this mountain together and enjoy it. Thank you all for listening.